Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In this special crossover episode, join me and Mike Karate of A History of Italy as we turn back the clock to 1492 and Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue during the exciting age of exploration. I hope you enjoy the final part of this discussion. Where is Columbus buried? His burial is, is a very interesting story. So it made me think sort of like um, Indiana Jones movie, you know, or one of your books, maybe, Mark, with the mysteries that even involved Nazis at a certain point. So I can say what we do know is that he died and was buried in Spain. He died in 1506. He was buried in Valladolid in Spain, and then he was briefly transferred in 1509 to the monastery de las Cuevas in Seville. Then in 1537, according to his own wishes, his son Diego had him transferred to Hispaniola, which is the island on which on the one side you have Haiti and on the other side you have the Dominican Republic. Now, some people say the story ends there, that he's still on Santo Domingo in the Cathedral of Santa Maria to this day. And that's because then there was a bit of confusion because the tomb he was in, some of the recognizing writings or marks were erased to avoid the, the remains being tampered with. So then another sort of line of the story has him going to Cuba when in 1795 France took over for, for not permanently, but took over the island. Uh, his remains were supposed to have been moved to Cuba. And shortly before that, I believe, no, sorry, shortly after that, bits of him, because uh, we're, we're talking ashes, may have been sent also to Genoa and to this, another Italian city, Pavia. And indeed, in Genoa, you can go and visit in one of the museums, a sort of urn, which is supposed to hold the remains of Christopher Columbus. Then, after the Spanish-American War, in 1891, he was supposed to have been moved back to Seville again, and supposedly he resides in the cathedral there. Going back to the bit of him that is in Geneva, it was stolen by the Nazis during the occupation of Geneva during the Second World War, and then it was an American general who brought it back to the city of Genoa. So, basically, the short answer to your question is we don't really know, Although there may be a bit of him in Santo Domingo, a bit of him in Seville, a bit of him in Genova, and a bit of him in Pavia, or all of him in Santo Domingo, possibly. Now, since his death, how has he been remembered, memorialized, honored, and celebrated in his place of birth? Does any physical history, Mike, still remain that connects to him, like a building, site, church, the port area? Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually go and visit his uh, Casa Natale, so his birth house, although probably it's not the house he was born in, but a house he went to live in when he was about uh, four, and that's near the ancient Roman walls. You can see that to this day. Genoa has two train stations, Principe and Brignole, and outside of Principe there's a monument to him. He has a gallery uh, named after him and a high school as well. Then also in the museum, the Museo di Sant'Agostino, museum in Genova, and the state archives have Christopher Columbus expositions. And there's also the Museo del Mare Galata, and that's where they also have that urn I mentioned before that supposedly hold at least part of his ashes, and they have that uh, on show. Then, of course, it's not specifically referred to Christopher Columbus, but the lighthouse of Genova, which is sort of the symbol of modern-day Genova, and it's also when they have the football derby between the two Genova teams, they call it the Derby of the Lanterna, which is the Genova lighthouse. That would have been already in place at the time of Columbus. So you can go and visit that and imagine him watching it as he left the port or came back into the port. Because unfortunately in 2018, there was quite a, a terrible accident in Genova. One of the highway bridges above the city fell, killing about 30 people, and they rebuilt that. And they had thought about naming it the Christopher Columbus Bridge, but they, they didn't go with that in the end. Then in Genoa, every year on Columbus Week, so not necessarily Columbus Day, but in the period around Columbus Day in Genoa, they have festivals and events. It's not a huge deal. You know, the, the average Genoa, obviously, you know, they, they, they know very well who Columbus was, what he did, how important he was, but it's not a huge, huge deal. I think he's more of a big deal in the United States than he is in Genoa, and definitely the rest of Italy. So to give you an example, uh, a few years back, they did one of those programs, you know, the most famous Italian, as they did 
for example, in the United Kingdom, where, where Churchill was deemed the, the most famous Briton, Christopher Columbus was on the list, but he was not on the top 10. There were more people, you know, Da Vinci, Dante, Michelangelo, Machiavelli, and, and so on. So you can find a lot of Columbus there, definitely, but maybe you, you, you would have sort of a bigger deal about him in the United States rather than in Italy. Tell us about the modern Genoa of the 2020s and how it still maintains its connection to the great explorer. Well, like we said before, you know, it has a lot of monuments and festivals and, and so on. It has recently been distracted by other events as well. It must be said that thanks to Christopher Columbus in 1992, so when we had the 500th anniversary of the revealing or discovery or whatever you want to call it of, of America, um, the city was, it got a huge makeover. It was a little bit dingy. You know, some of the air is a little bit dangerous, not well kept. And in 1992, it had this wonderful makeover and it's really become a beautiful city, especially the old area of the old port. They did it up very, very nicely. They built the Genoa Aquarium, which is one of the most famous in Italy. They, they built some attractions, some, let's say, sea-related attractions, like a, a big pirate ship a huge multiplex area with cinemas and things for the young people of Genova to go and, and hang out. And it is, to this day, a very, very beautiful city. It's on the sea, but at the same time, it's on the hills. So you can go up and down the hills through these little vicoli, these side streets to explore. Obviously, like every big city, it has some nice bits, it's some, some horrible, dark, dingy bits. It's, it's become a very lively place. It has this absolutely amazing theater. It's one of the few theaters in the world that has four stages. So two in the front, two in the back, but actually on this gigantic rotating mechanism. So when they're doing one show, they can prepare the next show and then they just start up the mechanism and one stage goes down underground and the next one comes up behind it. So Geneva, thanks to Columbus, is I'm not saying he's starting to forget him at all, but it's looking elsewhere. And But thanks to Columbus, it did get a really wonderful makeover. In the 2000s, unfortunately, Geneva has had some bad times. So 2001 was the year of the G8 conference in Geneva, which was surrounded by very high levels of violence, you know, both in terms of looting and vandalism, but also brutal, brutal and unnecessary violence on the part of the police to the point that in 2001, Amnesty International, which is, you know, quite an impartial observer of human rights, declared the G8 in Geneva one of the most terrible suspensions of human rights in, in modern Italian history. Geneva has suffered from a lot of floods. And then there was the tragedy of the Morandi Bridge I mentioned in, uh, in 2018. And, you know, Geneva has had other illustrious uh, sons. Uh, one of our foremost singer-songwriters, Fabrizio de André, was from Geneva. And, and at the beginning, we mentioned that Christopher Columbus would have spoken in his early life and learned and gone to school in Genoese. So if you want to hear what Genoese sounds like, you can look up some of Fabrizio de Andrea's songs and see how really different it is from, uh, let's say, standard Italian. Tell us a little bit about the Italian dialects. Most lay people think that Italian is one language, like English, and everyone speaks it, perhaps with a different accents in different regions, but I think it's much more complicated than that in Italy. It was, in the sense that up until the 1950s, very few people spoke Italians. It was only the intelligentsia, you know, the intellectual Italians, the, the politicians, the writers, the journalists who fluently spoke Italian. Uh, indeed, for example, one of Italy's foremost early politicians, Camillo Benso, Count of Cavour, was often made fun of for his bad Italian because he would have spoken Piedmontese. But nowadays, in, in the Italy of 2021, most young people would have difficulty speaking their local dialect, unless you go down south. So if you go down Calabria, Puglia, Sicily, Naples, many people are still bilingual. Basically, they speak Italian and they would speak their local dialect. In the area I live in, so Emilia, which is in the Emilia-Romagna region, we understand our dialect. I personally understand our dialect. If I try to speak it, my wife laughs at me because I sound a bit ridiculous, but the older people are still able to communicate. Speaking specifically of Genoese, I, I, um, I went and fished out a line from, from Fabrizio de Andrea, one of his most beautiful songs. And basically the line in English is, you will wake on the indico of the morning when the light has one foot on the land 
and the other in the sea. And in Italian, that would be Ti sveglierai sull'indaco del mattino, quando la luce ha un piede in terra e l'altro in mare. And that's standard Italian. In Genoese, it would be Ti ta descen descen den gudu du matin, calus la un pe in terra e l'altro in mare. So, totally different sounds from Italian in that case. So, we still have our dialects. Unfortunately, a lot of the northern dialects are dying out with the older generations. Well, that helps explain the differences between Italians who immigrated in large numbers, as you know, during the 19th and 20th century to North America. I visited Genoa in January 1993, a few weeks after the 500th anniversary celebrations ended. I was attending a business conference in the south of France on the Riviera and before flying home, drove across a nearby Italian border to the city. Having just missed the year-long festivities, I found Genoa to be somewhat sober and grey during this winter month, but was impressed with its colossal monuments and buildings and its magnificent port area. By the way, Mike, wasn't the port used for the dismantling of the Costa Concordia following the cruise ship disaster? Yes, yes, it was. Not, not, not obviously not the, the old port, but the, it was in Genoa, yeah. Where exactly do you reside in Italy? Okay, so I live in, in a little town called Reggio Emilia. It comes from the name Regium Lepidi. It was a Roman town founded by a consul, Marcus Emilius Lepidus, who is also responsible for our main road, the Via Emilia, which goes from Rimini down on the coast up to the city of Piacenza. And it, it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> here there's an interesting difference because for us Italians, I'm very far from Genoa. It's about a three and a half hour drive. For Americans, Canadians and Russians, for example, it's, it's around the corner. Because I always remember when we, you know, I lived, I had the great fortune of, of spending some time living in Virginia, which I loved. And, you know, in Virginia, going around the corner to the mall was a 45 minute drive. You know, in Italy, if you drive for 45 minutes, you're in a different province, no matter what different, what direction you go. But I was very lucky to have my uncle living in Geneva for many years. So I got to visit lots and lots of times and stay for, for some time every time I went because he had a flat there right in the center on, on Viale San Lorenzo, which is one of the main roads, one of the main historical, one of the main roads in the historical center. When was the last time you visited Genoa? Unfortunately, quite a while back. I, I couldn't pinpoint the year, but it must have been somewhere around 2005. Although perhaps the most memorable visit was in 2001, just before the events of the Geneva G8 conference in which I was sitting in, in, uh, in the room in my uncle's flat looking out and they were actually preparing for guerrilla warfare. I mean, they were, they were soldering iron bars and gates onto the two sides of these little tight, narrow streets. And, and it really looked like a city that was, you know, preparing for some kind of invasion. Well, this has been an enlightening visit to the birth city of Christopher Columbus. Thank you, Mike, for granting me the great honor and privilege of sharing your wonderful audience. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope we get to do it again soon. Right back at you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really love these kinds of collaborations, and I really think that history podcasting should see more of these. I, this, this should be sort of the basis of history podcasting, working together on our common, our often common history. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Join me next time as I pause our series timeline to highlight movies, TV series, programs, documentaries, and books that showcase the history of North America. Please consider supporting our History of North America series in the following ways. Join our growing community on Patreon. We offer lots of membership benefits, including artworks and books. Receive an ebook welcome gift upon joining. Donate with PayPal and also receive an ebook. I've written many historical nonfiction and fiction books, including exciting international historical mystery and suspense thrillers. One such novel, The Maesta Panels, is set in beautiful Italy, the birthplace of Genoese explorer Christopher Columbus. All my books are available in print and digital format on Amazon. If you shop Amazon for books or anything else, Make sure to use our free link so Amazon knows who sent you, thereby giving us extra credit with no supplemental cost to you. All links appear in this show's description and on our website at markvinet.com. Spread the word to family and friends. And remember, 
All positive ratings, reviews, feedback, and comments are appreciated. This helps us expand our audience. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.